Well, what a joy it is to be in God's house on this beautiful Wednesday, and thank you for making this midweek service a priority and putting it on your schedule and being faithful in this place. I don't know about you, but I have thoroughly enjoyed our pastor these past few Sundays, haven't you? And uh, my, it's been such a blessing, and what a joy, and pastor, thank you so much for the opportunity to bring the midweek study this week, and uh, I don't take this lightly. I've been looking forward to this time as we take our copies of the Word of God and turn to Psalm chapter 119. Psalm chapter 119 is where we're going to have our study tonight, and you'll notice on your outline the title, Real Freedom. I'm thankful for the Word of God. I'm thankful we have a uh, written copy here with us tonight, and uh, real freedom in our lives is really experienced by obedience to and submission to the Word of God. In chapter 119, we're going to notice just one verse here, and if you would stand out of honor for reading the Word of God, we're going to look at verse number 41. Psalm chapter 119 and verse number 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation, according to thy word. God, I do ask that you would bless these next few moments as we look into your word for application and experiencing this real freedom that we truly find in this passage. We ask now that you would use the, your words to illuminate our path as we look to apply what we find in these short verses. In your name, the Lord Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Now this particular psalm, Psalm chapter 119, has been called the alphabet of divine love. This psalm has also been called the paradise of all doctrines and the school of truth. It would be said by some that Psalm chapter 119 is the brightest star in the constellation of the Psalms. This, of course, is the longest chapter in uh, the book of Psalms, and all we need to do is turn to verse number one to see the direction that the psalmist set for this entire book. If you have your copy open there, look back just a few verses to verse number one, where we see... Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Psalm chapter 119 speaks of the greatness and the glory of the word of God. And the psalmist does not take his eye off of this fact. The entire book of the Psalms here in chapter 119 is the longest chapter, and the psalmist gives the longest chapter to talk about the priority of the Word of God in his daily life. This is an alphabetical psalm. No doubt you are aware that there are 22 Hebrew letters. Tonight we're looking at the sixth uh, Hebrew letter tonight, pronounced Vav. Here we understand that the psalm 119 is eight stanzas of commenced uh, of the Hebrew alphabet spoken about each letter, and it's done in a way that's alphabetical. I truly believe that it's alphabetical and it contains all the elements of the knowledge and the wisdom that we need really in life. Now, God loves communicating to you and I in orderly ways. For those that would maybe have more of an OCD type of mindset, your mind enjoys the layout of Psalm chapter 119. To see each letter have eight verses that corresponds with that letter. You know, God enjoys communicating with us in organized, attractive ways to help gain our attention. Why do you think the sunsets are so beautiful? Why do you think the mountains are so grand? God, who is the creator, obviously, reveals his, his will, and he reveals himself in many different ways. But specifically tonight, we see in Psalm 119, these letters are given eight different verses to communicate all that we need to know. It is understood that Matthew Henry's dad, Philip Henry, advised his son to take a verse of this particular psalm every morning to meditate upon it, 
So therefore, he would work through this entire psalm twice in the year. He said that Psalm 119 will bring you to be in love with all of the rest of the scriptures. And Philip Henry taught his son, Matthew Henry, that all grace grows as love to the word of God grows. And is that not what Peter would remind us of in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18? That the Christian's goal in this life is to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as Christians, a sure sign of our growth corresponds with our love for the Word of God. And this is not some type of flippant love. This is not just simply for us to hold up our Bible tonight and say that we love the Word of God, but rather it has a tug on our feelings, it demands time on our schedule, and we spend time with it every single day. In our house, we have a few things that we measure ourselves by. I think of my, ki my children tonight, and on their birthday and on their half birthday, we take time to measure their progress. And obviously, as I have small kids and young kids, we have graffiti on this thing at the bottom by them finding the chalk marker and starting to write around with it as there's many spots in our house like that. But on their birthday and on their half birthday, we enjoy as parents taking time to mark their progress. The growing disciple will be able to look back to a recent time to find their growth as a Christian and how it correlates with the Word of God. It's impossible to grow as a Christian subtracting the Word of God from our daily lives. We also have different things in our house to help us with measuring ourselves. I don't measure myself anymore on the board. We're starting to step on some of these. We are consistently tracking our progress to see how is our health doing and see how our kids are developing and how they are growing. So here the psalmist is taking a portion of the Hebrew alphabet and going to say to us what the Word of God means to him with this particular Hebrew letter, Vav. Now tonight we specifically look at this six letter. This word, or this rather, uh, this uh, Hebrew letter, Vav, expresses firm trust and intense delight in God's word and an earnest desire to see it fully accomplished. Now that's great. I'm going to say that one more time. I want you to wrap your mind around what this particular letter would mean. It means an intense delight in the word of God in an earnest desire to see it fully accomplished, an awakened comfort in the hope of God. I want you to see here in verse number 41, David's talk with God. In verse number 41, the Bible tells us, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. Here we notice a simple prayer. Let thy mercies come. Now wrap your mind around this tonight, church, where David was not simply asking to learn about the scriptures, but rather David was expecting God to supernaturally transform his life through salvation. Is that not what takes place? When someone gets salvation, they get the life-changing and the life-giving message of Jesus. And David here is simply praying, let your mercies come to me. I would imagine on a night like this that this is the majority of the core of the Lancaster Baptist Church. So wrap your mind around this. Remember that you and I not only need to teach mercy, but we also need to experience, experience mercy. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. Now, God's mercy is so great that it has to always be described in the plural. You see that? In verse number 41, let thy mercies come also unto me. 
It is extremely possible that we have millions of people dwelling in this wonderful free land, but under the bondage and under the chains of sin. And here David is saying, oh, let your mercies come unto me. Not just your mercy, but I know who I am. I need your mercies. Each person without Christ, oh, how miserable that person is. But notice a stabilizing promise. Not just a simple prayer, but he says in verse 41, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. Now one can see David's clear dependence upon the grace and promise of God for salvation in this verse. Thy mercy and salvation according to thy word. I want you to notice with me these two pillars in which his hope is built upon Christ. And of course, that is the grace of God. Let thy mercies, even thy salvation. Of course, our salvation is not of our own merit. Eternal life must not be expected. Anything that we have to offer, but it must be expected as the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the promise of God, not just the grace of God, but the promise of God. Mercy and salvation come to man through the word. I would imagine tonight we could drive out and we could see a beautiful Joshua tree. I love those Joshua trees. Or tonight you could look out and see the stars tonight in the sky and how beautiful those are. And from those facts of creation, we could no doubt Assume and come to the conclusion that there's a creator behind the creation. But when it comes to the specific need of confessing my sin for the need of a savior, mercy and salvation come through the word of God. In verse 41, it says, according to thy word. The Apostle Paul, later on in the book of Corinthians, would put it this way, for all the promises of God in him are a yea and in him amen unto the glory of God for us. I am so glad, no doubt, as many of you tonight, that we can take these promises to the bank and cash out. These are wonderful promises that bring stability in our lives, but notice a safe position. Here, David is praying a simple prayer, a stabilizing promise, but a safe position. Look at verse number 42 as we walk through this section of the Psalms tonight. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. The word reproach in this particular passage means disapproval with an element of disgrace. This is not simply someone that's just being mean to you, but this is someone that is disapproving of what you believe and here with some type of disgrace towards you. They are frustrated with what you believe. David's confidence was in God, but also in God's word. You see that in verse 42, for I trust in thy word. Now catch this because it's so easy for you and I to slip in this particular area when people depend upon circumstances or other people for the strength that they need in the daily uh, in and out of life. They are constantly frustrated and constantly worried. Oh, when we depend upon circumstances, that raise or bonus or that person to fulfill the need that maybe we have, we live a life of frustration in a life that is constantly, constantly worried. Now, it's like when you are driving on an empty tank of gas. Have you been there? 
My, I'll tell you, just a few weeks ago, my needle was leaning towards empty, and I was heading out all the way to Lake LA, not very many places to stop and get some gas. And no doubt, many of you have maybe made that trek, maybe from the Antelope Valley over to Phoenix or somewhere other than that, and your needle is leaning towards empty. It can cause frustration. Where's a place to refill? And it can certainly cause worry in the sense of, man, where do I go if I run out of gas. For those that depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, Christ energizes us and he motivates us in the inner person with all the adequate energy that we need for every circumstance of life. Trusting in God's word, trusting in God's promises provides answers to those who would reproach us. You see that in verse 42, so shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me. Our main weapon of defense in this Christian walk of those who would want to cause harm to us, of course, is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And Paul reminds us of that in the book of Ephesians. Now, why would we need this? Why would we need this guard? We need this guard of God's word, not only in our hearts, but also deep in our minds, not just to keep us from sin, but to equip us with the answers needed for those who would oppose us, but also for those that would maybe ask of the hope that lies within us. Paul reminds us of that later on in the book of Peter. So we're noticing tonight David's simple talk with God. There's a simple prayer. There's a stabilizing promise, but there's also a safe position. Notice with me as we turn the corner here to point two, David's heart towards God. David's heart towards God. Now, all too frequently in this life, we major on what people can see and we minor on what only God sees. So oftentimes we want to make sure that we look right. And I'm glad that we do. And you did a great job with that tonight. But oftentimes if we neglect what only God can see, it will eventually show up on the outside. But so frequently we neglect the inner man. The psalmist did not have the attitude towards this book of, well, if I have time, or this can take the back seat unless there's something else that comes up. No, this, the psalmist's attitude and practice towards the word of God can be seen just about a page or two over. Look in verse 164 of this particular chapter. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. And you and I would do well tonight to set a few extra reminders on our phone simply to pull over from the distractions of life simply to practice how the psalmist did. Oh, to praise the Lord because of thy righteous judgments. Notice the quote there in your outline from Warren Wiersbe. The inner person has an appetite that must be satisfied. If it isn't satisfied by truth and reality, it will feed on lies and illusions, but it must be fed. Here, you'll notice with me in this section of the chapter that we're looking at in verse 43, a humble request. David says, and take not the word of truth out, out of my mouth, utterly out of my mouth. For I have hoped in thy judgments. Oh, just picture what he's saying here. We'll talk about it in just a second. Look at verse 44. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. Now rooted in the understanding that it is only the goodness and grace of God that we even have a copy of the Word of God, David is saying, let it continue in my life. Have you paused to consider recently of just how amazing it is to have God's revelation to us in specific form? Now, I guess we could suppose 
that God could have created and not communicate. But God did create and he did communicate and it blew the mind of the psalmist. In Psalm 33 and verse 11, he would write, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. The word of God is an expression of God's love for us. All of us should be incredibly thankful for the copy that we have in our hands tonight. What a gift from God to have the written word in our hands. It's only a wise prayer. It's only a wise statement for the psalmist to say something like verse 43. It is very wise that one would pray to God that the word of God would remain in our lives. Oftentimes, the devil doesn't need to destroy us because he has so many distractions coming our way. And oftentimes in the Christian life, the reason why we don't spend more time is because of the defeated daily distractions that come our way. The, the psalmist is meaning here in verse 43, Lord, let the word of truth be always on my mouth. Why would he pray something like that? I truly believe because he wanted to make a profession of his faith whenever he was called to it. You're reminded in the book of Peter where Peter exhorted Christians, but sanctify the Lord God always in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. David found that at times in his life, he was at a loss for what the Word of God said. Have you been there? I don't know, when you're out maybe knocking on a door, you wonder what the question's going to be, and you wonder, can I articulate my thoughts in a way that would be able to answer sufficiently from the Scriptures? And David here is essentially praying the prayer Lord, make me ready to give an account or be, help me to be ready in my lips to share what your word says. And how many Christians need to pray, even myself included tonight, this simple prayer of Lord, make me ready. Help me to pray the same humble request to be ready to give an answer. Oh, may I always have your word in my mouth. You'll notice this humble request. This does not mean for you Christians tonight and myself that we need to memorize the entire word of God to be effectively used in ministry. But it does mean that we need a total dependence upon God to help us in the midst of difficult conversations that, that come our way. Oh, there's a humble request. Help your law to be in my mouth, but then also a hearty resolution. Do you see that in verse 43 there towards the end? For I have hoped in thy judgments. Now, though a person might resolve in his heart that he wants to be more like Christ, all efforts will fail unless he takes the word of God seriously. Here, the psalmist is saying, your judgments are my support and my defense. I have hoped in thy judgments in the past, and it didn't let me down. So therefore, in the future, I will continue to hope in thy judgments. But notice with me on how he resolves to continue to keep God's law. Notice this, he is constantly conforming. Do you see that in verse 44? So shall I keep thy law continually. My, I love this. This has the idea of a continual obedience. Continual obedience. Have you ever noticed how one bad decision can easily lead to another bad decision? Last week, Brother Larry Chapel and I were having a meeting, and Larry offered me a Snickers bar. 
That led to another Snickers bar. Sometimes bad decisions make it easier for other bad decisions to come. But I truly believe that it can also mean the same with good decisions. I believe you can get on a good streak of making good decisions that points you in a direction that's pleasing to God. And here David's saying, I continually conform, I continually obey what the law is saying. You've often heard from our pastor, something that I oftentimes want to teach others, obey every impulse of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's been estimated that the average person makes 35,000 decisions per day. That's an amazing number. 35,000 decisions per day. What color shoes did you put on? What did you eat for breakfast? Did you work out or did you choose not to work out? Uh, Did you put gas in the car? What parking lot did you choose at work? What parking lot did you choose tonight? Oh, there's all these decisions that come our way on a daily, continual basis. Let me ask you a personal question that you answer on the inside. How did you do today continually obeying the Lord? The psalmist is giving us a pattern in which we need to follow tonight. He says, I am constantly conforming. I'm continually obeying. But notice that he not only stops there, he goes on to say he's forever reaching forward. Oh, this is such a good thought. Look there at the end of verse 44, forever and ever. Now you are either stand you are either reaching forward in this Christian life or you are drifting backwards in this Christian life but there is no standing still in this Christian life. David here is saying I am forever reaching forward and if we had more time we would talk about the generations that he would go on to impact and here he is impacting our lives even tonight but he's saying I am reaching forward. You're very familiar with the Apostle Paul writing to the church there in Philippi where he says in chapter 3 and verse 12 and 13, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And David is painting the picture for us here in the Old Testament of what it means to press toward the mark. Every so often I'll go on a run and uh, when I'm not running to the fridge, I'll maybe try to run a little bit further, but usually my runs don't last all that long before I am fatigued and I am tired. Does it ever amaze you on how quickly you can become fatigued and how long it takes you to recharge? In this Christian life, if we're not careful, we can experience and start to experience spiritual fatigue. Sometimes we feel that we need a vacation after the vacation. And sometimes in this Christian life, we can feel, I don't know if I can continue to go forward. I am spiritually tired. Oh, what many of us do not need tonight is another vacation, although I'm all for it. I'm all for extra time away and getting some time with family. Those are wonderful things that should be taken. But what we really need tonight is ultimately to be refreshed uh, fresh by the word of God constantly in our daily walk. Now catch this. This is part of the crutch of this lesson before we open up the application in just a second. We love his will when our hearts are reconciled and renewed. We love his will when our hearts are reconciled and renewed. And I would assume percentage-wise tonight that the vast majority of us are reconciled tonight, but are you renewed tonight? Are you delighting in his will tonight as we see the psalmist? Take your copy of the word of God and turn over a few pages to Psalm chapter 63. 
if we're going to continue to keep his law continually, if we're going to be constantly obeying his law forever and ever, we must constantly need to be refreshed and renewed in the word or we will become spiritually fatigued. I'm going to give this as part of my assignment to you. I hope you'll take this homework assignment during these summer months and maybe spend more time in this particular chapter. We're only going to notice a few verses here, but how it will lift your soul and how it will help you in the seasons of spiritual fatigue. Look at what the psalmist says in verse 1. O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Drop down with me to verse number six. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings I will rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. Paul, later on, in, uh, would write to the Christians in Galatia, and he would say, Oh, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let me challenge you this week, Christian, to maybe jump back to Psalm 63 and allow your soul to be refreshed by this chapter. Oh, we've seen David's talk with God. Oh, a simple prayer, let your mercies come to me. Oh, we've seen David's heart for God. He had a humble request. May your word be constantly on my lips, but also a hearty resolution that he would constantly conform to what the law was teaching. But then I want you to notice here David's walk for God. David's walk for God. Now many people have the strange idea that God's law and man's liberty are enemies. You think of this, we often find people saying, I want freedom, therefore I am going to do whatever I want to do. And that is a terrible form of bondage. You know, God's law is not against man's liberty. God's law and our liberty actually go hand in hand. Look at the next verse. Verse number 45 teaches us, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Charles Spurgeon said it so well. God's people finds no bondage in holiness. I love that. God's people finds no bondage in holiness. Real freedom is life controlled by God's truth is what he's teaching here. And it's motivated by God's love. We're going to drop down here in just a second to see the psalmist love for the law of God. Disobedience always leads to deeper bondage. Every single time. I love, I think, how it was said by Dr. Tom Farrell back when he was preaching. You can never sin and win. Never. Sin always leads to deeper levels of bondage, although at the beginning it looks good, but it leads to destruction. Let's learn how David experienced real freedom. David has moved from his talk. He's moved to his heart, and now his affection is now being translated into application, and that's how it should work in our lives. Oh, as we talk with God, and as we have a heart for God, our affection for his word should move us to practical application. So notice with me in verse 45, an extensive pursuit. He says there at the end of this verse, for I seek thy precepts. 
This is the psalmist saying, I am doing everything possible in my human strength to find out how I can mimic Christ in my everyday living. That's what he's saying. I am seeking after thy precepts. I love how one preacher put it. He said, the way of holiness is not a track for slaves, but the king's highway for free men. I love that. It's not a track for slaves, but it's the king's highway for free men. It is the deception of the devil that would cause us to think that following God's instruction is some form of bondage. Just the opposite is true. Capture this with me. If you know God, you will know freedom. But if you say no God, there's not going to be any freedom. And haven't we seen that reflected even in the recent days, even in our own land where we're saying, no, God, and we expect more freedom, but there comes greater animosity. And if you know God, you will truly know freedom. And that's what the psalmist is writing about in this particular passage. David intensely desired to know God and to know God's duty. The better you know the word of God, the better you will be able to grip on to God's will. So I want you to notice this extensive pursuit. I'm continually seeking after your precepts leads to an expressed application. An expressed application. Now our lives speak for the Lord when our walk matches our talk. David begins with a talk with God, but now he's expressing it through his walk for God. Now, I want you to capture this, and if it's only me that would comprehend this tonight, just listen as I would talk to myself tonight. But God wants us to bring eternal perspective into our daily living. God wants us to bring eternal perspective into our daily decisions and in the way that we do life. So often we're distracted by the here, distracted by the now, distracted by whatever the devil is trying to distract us with, but the Lord wants us to be in the moment with him. Our lives speak for the Lord, and this is what David is promising himself in the grace of God. The remainder of this chapter is simply David's response to the application that he's going to live out. And I want you to see that with me. He says that he should be free in his duty. Verse number 45, and I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. Matthew Henry said it so well, the service of sin is perfect slavery. The service of God is perfect liberty. And the psalmist is saying, I will be free in my duty by walking and seeking your precepts. Jesus would teach us later on in John chapter 8. It's in your notes. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And, he shall, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Oh, don't buy into the deception that following God's instruction is any type of bondage, but rather it leads to greater freedom. Number two, here's the application of the psalmist that his private preparation would result in bold and courageous duty. Verse 46, I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings. What an amazing statement. Here is the psalmist saying, I'm going to be prepared to speak before kings and I will not be ashamed. Many of us tonight need not to be afraid to own what we truly believe. 
We've oftentimes heard your belief will affect the way you behave. And we ought to not be ashamed of our beliefs. Just as the three Hebrew children stood up to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3, where he says, we are not so careful to answer thee in this matter. Oh, it is good for those in leadership. It's good for those in authority to hear what Christians like you and I have to say. And the psalmist is saying, I will speak thy testimonies. I'll be courageous and bold because of my private preparation. But notice number three, his application. The commitment that he made in the grace of God. Number three, that his daily delight in the scriptures would cause him to be cheerful and pleasant in his duty. Now, this is wonderful. Verse 47, and I will delight myself in thy commandments. Now, you have to capture this because many of us will read it and just go on to the next verse, but he says, I will delight myself. This is an intentional decision made by the psalmist. He didn't wait for the feeling. If you and I had to feel like we wanted to come to church tonight, maybe some of you wouldn't have showed up. But you made the intentional decision to come. And I'm so glad that you did. And here the psalmist is saying, he's making a willful uh, decision. I will delight myself in thy commandments. When I think of delight, oftentimes my mind goes to Tillamook ice cream. And many of you all just maybe woke up right about there thinking about Tillamook ice cream. I love Tillamook ice cream. Give me a spoon and a whole carton of that thing. Man, I'm going to find a lot of delight in that ice cream. Well, how much the more do we need to intake the word of God and meditate on it and how it will have an impact. It'll have a cheerful impact and a pleasant impact in our duty. Notice number four. Because of his inward transformation, it would reflect in diligent and vigorous duty. Verse 48. My hands also will I lift up thy commandments, which I have loved. Man, this is so good. Biblical knowledge must translate into practical application. Does the book of James not so say it so clear for us? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And here the psalmist is saying, my hands also will I lift up. This this is not just the word of God impacting the psalmist's head. It's not just impacting his heart, but it's having an impact on his hands. And he's lifting up unto thy commandments. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now catch this. I love this little quote under this point. The mind grows by taking in. The heart grows by giving out. Here tonight we are taking in. God has spoken to us through his word, but now it's our job to communicate it out. The mind grows by bringing in, the heart grows by giving out, and these two must always be balanced. We don't want to always be just on the knowledgeable side, but we want to be on the practical side, bringing the life-giving message of Jesus to others. Before we see the last one here, I want you to notice what the psalmist quoted twice in verses 47 and 48 which I have loved. This is pretty awesome. When Gloria and I were dating in Bible college, and even still to this day, do I get love letters from Gloria. Man, when I would get those love letters, maybe outside of the dorm before curfew, man, we would go back to our rooms, and I would be excited to read every single word she wanted to communicate to me. Oh, the psalmist had a love for the word of God. His affection for the word of God turned into practical application. Our love for the word of God is a reflection of our love for the God of the word. Here, the psalmist is saying, I love him. I love the law because I love the lawgiver. And then number five, as we close... Due to his intentional meditation, his duty would be thoughtful and considerate. And I will meditate in thy statutes. 
It's been said by a pastor of yesteryear, why then is the Bible read only and not meditated on? Because it is not loved. We do not go to it as a hungry man to his food or to, as a miser to his treasure. What a great loss. Picture this. David, the psalmist, is writing, I will meditate. Once again, a willful decision to put his mind, as Paul would later on say to the church there in Philippi, think on these things. Intentionally direct your mind to the word of God. David is saying, I will give my time and I will give my energy to the word of God. My, what a privilege to think that the psalmist would say that he would give his time and energy to a portion of the counsel of God. And we tonight are seated here tonight with the entire counsel of the word of God. How much the more we should grab a hold of this example and say, God, I am going to willfully choose to meditate on your statutes. So the closing thoughts tonight. We've seen David's talk with God. You know, in a crowd this size, I would assume that there's maybe even a person still here that would still need to pray the simple prayer, let your mercies come to me. But for most of us tonight, we need to make sure that we are resting confidently in the stabilizing promises like the psalmist taught us. We need to maybe realign our heart toward God with this humble request to make sure that his words are continually on our lips. Maybe it's in need tonight to make a hearty resolution to say, God, I haven't always been continually conforming to your word, but tonight I'm going to continually obey your impulses. And maybe for some of us tonight, We simply need to grab a hold of this extensive pursuit of continually seeking after his precepts. You know, so often our devotions can become a checkbox. Oh, it's more than just a checkbox, but rather the psalmist would say, oh, I love the law of God. Let me challenge you tonight with this real freedom. So let me ask you, are you enjoying Real freedom tonight. Oh, sure. Tomorrow our country celebrates and how thankful I am for this great land. But you can live in a great land that's classified as free and still be in great bondage. Oh, there's real freedom for your life and for my life when we come into impact with this word that we've seen tonight. If you are not experiencing this real freedom, you can take a step towards real freedom tonight by submitting to the word of God. Real freedom comes through obedience and submission to God as we follow the instruction of his word. 